Thank you for everyone that has joined us on this um, long cancer awareness webinar organized by Move Against Cancer Nigeria. Africa, sorry. My name is Abiodwe Green, I'm a medical doctor and a field epidemiologist. And I would like to appreciate all our guests who have joined us today. We would also like to apologize for starting this session at 1 p.m. instead of um, um, starting the session at 3 p.m. instead of 1 p.m. at earlier schedule. Thank you for still taking our time to join this session. I would also like to appreciate all our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Scobia, Eat to Leave, Longevity, Travel Wahoo, uh, for um, sponsoring this um, event. We are very grateful. Before we start the session, please note that the session is being recorded. This recording will be shared with all attendees at the end of the webinar. You can also send in your questions using the Q&A uh, box on the platform. And why are we gathered here today? We do know that lung cancer is one of the most common form of cancer with um, over 2 million persons diagnosed worldwide. It's also the leading cause of cancer death globally. 20 years ago, the Lung Cancer Alliance launched the Lung Cancer Awareness Day in the United States to raise awareness and recognition of the typical symptoms of lung cancer which we will learn more about from our panelists. This month is now being observed globally, and the aim is to raise awareness on this disease, encourage people to seek medical advice sooner, and to also encourage early diagnosis so that we can improve patient outcomes. We also use this month to highlight other important factors that influence patient outcomes and challenge the stigma associated with lung cancer. Today, we have two persons, two panelists with us, erudite doctors who have dedicated their careers to the management of cancer patients. Um, our first panelist is Professor Taufik Owonikoko. Dr. Taufik Owonikoko is a professor in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology at Emory University School of Medicine. He received his medical degree from Abafemiolo University in 1991 after which he completed his residency as a physician in anatomic pathology at the Lagos University Children's Hospital of Nigeria. He later proceeded to Dusseldorf, Germany for further training in anatomic pathology on an international training grant award from the prestigious German academic exchange program. He received a PhD from the Heinrich Hein University in 2001 after which he proceeded to John Hopkins University in Baltimore for postdoctoral training in molecular imaging. A board certified medical oncologist, Dr. Onikoko specializes in the treatment of lung cancer, thyroid cancer, and other cancers of the aerodigestive tract. He serves as a co-leader of the Discovery and Developmental Therapeutics Research Program at Winship Cancer Institute. He also serves as the chair of the Lung and Aerodigestive Malignancies Working Group and co-chair of the Head and Neck Working Group for the Radiation Research Program in the NCICTEP Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. You are welcome, Professor Winifoku. Thank you for joining us today. Our second Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Pro. Our second panelist for today is Dr. Kester. Madwadi. Dr. Madwadi is a dedicated radiologist with bias for interventional radiology. He graduated from the University of Port Harcourt with a medical degree in 2006 and a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons Faculty of Radiology. He also holds a certificate in oncology imaging from the Institute of Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology, Jena University Hospital, Germany. He is a scholar of the European School of Radiology, a two-time visiting scholar of the Society of Interventional Oncology, um, USA. He's a member of several local and international radiological societies, including Nigerian Society of Interventional Radiologists, European Society of Radiology, Radiological Society of North America, Society of Interventional Radiology, and Society of Interventional Oncology. He's presently the consultant radiologist at the Zenith Medical and Kidney Center in Abuja. You are welcome, Dr. Madwadi. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much for being on this uh, webinar. So my first question is for both of our panelists. What is cancer? A lot of people have heard of this term, cancer, but I do know that it's still confusing. So please, can you explain to our attendees what is cancer in very simple terms? Dr. Taufik, please, you can go um, first. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everyone joining us from uh, all around the country and potentially all around the world. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this panel. And I hope that this will help um, our population at large to better understand what the problem is and hopefully set us on a path to positively impact the outcome for patients. So strictly answering your question, what is cancer? Um, when we think about a lot of things going on in our body, uh, the body has a way of regulating itself. Uh, you can imagine when you have a wound that cut. You heal the cut by growing back the tissue that you lost the wound. But the body also recognizes when to stop. So when the wound is healed, the growth stops. Uh, so at any particular point in time, there is a very fine balance between the amount of tissue that is dying in our body and the amount of tissue that is formed newly to replace it. But just like everything else in life, things can go wrong. And there are situations where the body, a particular part of the body may not recognize when to stop growing. And um, it is that uncontrolled of tissue in any part of the body that results in cancer. If you catch it early and you take it out of the body, that can result in curing that uh, disease. But if you don't catch it early, the challenge with cancer is continues to grow and then acquires more um, characteristics that make it travel. We say travel throughout the body. That is when we say it is metastatic. And once you reach that stage, it becomes very deadly and for most Thank you, Dr. Taufik. So, um, Dr. Madwadi, uh, Dr. Taufik has really talked about cancer. Why is, in, why is it important that we are raising awareness on, on lung cancer? Why is this an important cancer? Why should we pay attention to this cancer? Thank you very much, Dr. Abiodun, for the opportunity. So, yeah, like Dr. Tauf rightly said, cancer simply means a growth in the one or in any part of the body. Because it's a growth, it is not an usual growth that is under control, it's out of control and can grow to, can travel like in its words to, to different parts of the body. Now, talking about lung cancer in itself, lung cancer simply means this growth is in the lung. This growth itself is in the lung. And if this um, is occurring in the lung tissue, and then um, you know the lung is that part, that spongy organ in the body that is found in the rib cage. Just in the chest region, you have two spongy organs that helps in breathing. So when because it is contained in the bony structure in the chest region, you're not going to be able to see this growth when it's occurring. So um, it becomes important to identify this growth early enough before it travels to the different parts of the body when it becomes um, incurable. So it's very important that we identify this growth and that's the essence of letting people know how do you know that this growth is present in your body? What are the things that um, increases the chances of you having this growth? Um, what behavioral changes do you need to have or um, um, what actually influences this growth presence or absence in the body? So an idea of this, knowing these few things can have some significant impact in um, the result, even if you finally have the growth eventually in life, the awareness we're trying to raise now will help to uh, detect it early enough when treatment can be offered with um, good, with, some, with um, uh, some level of success. 
Thank you, Dr. Madwadi. So just writing on that question now, still back to you. Is lung cancer a smoker's disease? When people hear lung cancer, they think of smoking. People are not sure what causes lung cancer. Is it caused by witchcraft? Is it hereditary? If you, if you, associate, with, if you associate with smoke, um, how about people that cook with firewood? What are the predisposing factors for lung cancer occurrence? Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the, it's important to know that there are various um, forms of lung cancer, but generally cigarette smoking is one of the most important culprits. One of the most important causes of lung cancer globally is cigarette smoking. And it's been found that the more cigarettes, the more number of cigarettes someone is exposed to, the higher the risk, the higher the chances that the person is exposed to, is likely to develop lung cancer in his or her lifetime. But not having said that, cigarette smoking is not the only risk factor for lung cancer. There are a couple of other things that predisposes someone to having um, lung cancer. These include things like um, exposure to other chemicals like radon. Radon is a form of, um, is, is a gas, and is a toxic gas that could come from fossils, from soil, from the sea, and then it can get built up in, within our homes, our, um, in our environment to a dangerous level. And, a lot of us may not know that this radon is existing, except that except to get environmental or public health specialists to measure radon levels in our environment. We may not necessarily know that we're exposed to this radon uh, uh, gas. Then even little or other little things like obesity, obesity contributes to all these things. Then people who work in certain industries, where you have nickel, you have um, silica, silica. Um, these are all risk factors for, for lung cancer. People who have had previous radiation therapy, who have had uh, maybe um, as young, at a younger age group, they were exposed to, uh, to they have some form of cancer that, that have to be treated with because it is more high it predisposes them to possible risk of lung cancer in the future as they age in, in life. And a couple of um, other risk factors uh, that um, we might talk along the line. Yes, uh, but I still pose the question because a lot of people, they would say, oh, I never smoked. I don't live with someone that smoked, but I have lung cancer. And they are worried. How did I get this cancer? I think to just still, maybe to Dr. Taufik, why, what are the causes of lung cancer? Because people, I've seen patients that come, they are sad, I don't smoke. But you said smoking and lung cancer, and I've kept all the rules. Why am I still having lung cancer? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Dr. Madwadi already highlighted some of the well-established risk factors for developing lung cancer. And, you know, in different parts of the world where there is accurate record keeping, of cancer over time, and also evolution of different types of activities. Note that, especially less about the US, for instance, that the majority of patients who develop lung cancer, and I want to quickly use this opportunity to clarify for our audience, we name cancer by the organ in which it started from not which organ it has gone to. So cancer can go to different organs. So when we're talking of lung cancer, we are talking of cancer that started primarily in the lung, not cancer that started somewhere else and came to the lung. So you can have breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, thyroid cancer, whatever other type of cancer that will show up in the lung. In fact, lung is one of the most frequently affected organ by any cancer type in the body when they spread. But our discussion today is talking about those patients who develop lung cancer, primarily in the lung, that close to 80% of those patients from epidemiologic, longitudinal epidemiologic data uh, occurred in those who had very heavy exposure to tobacco. 
And historically in the US, when you follow the incidence data, you will see that before the advent of rolling tobacco into cigarettes for people to smoke and be able to smoke it heavily, the incidence of lung cancer is really, really low. With the industrial evolution that allowed tobacco to be rolled and to be sold in large quantities, you see the incidence and that remains so until the Surgeon General warning in the mid 1900s, where it was clearly linked to the incidence of lung cancer, it was started to uh, become part of the um, community based effort to address the incidence of lung cancer by discouraging people from smoking. And then once people started dropping the attitude and the behavior of you know, glamorizing tobacco use, you can also see this gradual fall uh, in the incidence of lung cancer. There is about a 20 to 30 year lag time between when people will smoke and get exposed to tobacco carcinogens and when the lung cancer will develop. So somebody can say, I smoke and I don't have lung cancer. That is not uh, incorrect. It's that it takes a long time for the effect of the tobacco and the lung to manifest as lung cancer. Now, having said that, now that the use of tobacco products is going down, uh, at least regular tobacco in form of cigarette is going down, we've also seen a drop in the proportion of lung cancer ascribed or attributed to exposure to tobacco. In fact, these days, the highest incidence of lung cancer in terms of rate of uh, developing lung cancer now is highest in those patients who never had any direct exposure or direct use of tobacco. Uh, what is responsible for that? We don't have very clear answer yet. About 20% of patients in the U.S. will have lung cancer without any established documented history of tobacco use or exposure to heavy chemicals in industries. Uh, radon could be a risk factor, but that is very, very uh, uh, low in terms of the proportion of patients that will develop lung cancer from that. So the 20% of patients who do not have exposure to tobacco and develop lung cancer, that is actually one of the areas of active investigation now uh, to understand why do they develop it. We know they have it. We don't know why, but there are some unique uh, uh, um, characteristics of those patients. One is they tend to be younger. Uh, secondly, when you take the tumor out and you assess for genetic changes within the cancer cells, you will see that there are unique changes in the terms of the genetic content of the cancer cell that you can actually use targeted therapy for. So those are what we now call the non-tobacco associated lung cancer. If you go to a place like China, it's about 40% of their patients. Mm -hmm. In Nigeria, it's difficult to know because we don't have as accurate data collection as we would need. But at least if you go by the W, the seventh most common cancer of all types after you've gone to breast, prostate, colon, and all the rest of them. And in the whole of African continent, lung cancer is the fifth most common cancer overall. So it's not a disease that we can just ignore and say it's not there. It is there. Part of the challenge that we face, as Dr. Madhuadi uh, rightly pointed uh, out, it's not something that you can see with your eyes. It's not something you can touch with your fingers, and you cannot smell it. So oftentimes, a lot of our patients may even develop lung cancer and die from it without us knowing. Uh, and then would ascribe it to other things. You know, with regard to your question about firewood use, I think it would be a little bit arrogant to just say it doesn't cause it. All we can say is we do not know because we've not studied it. Uh, there is the theory, of, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in Chinese population that open fire cooking, which would be similar to firewood use in Nigeria, could be one of the risk factors for patients to develop lung cancer. And like, as I indicated, 40% of their patients are never smokers who develop lung cancer. So is it the firewood itself? I don't think so. It could be the 
you know, what you are burning, what is getting out of the smoke, or it could be what you are cooking on top of the firewood that is escaping into the vapor that you are inhaling. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. And um, well, it's important for people to recognize that even if you never smoked, there is still the possibility of developing lung cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Taufik. I think you've answered a question of one of our attendees that is asking about what about the other forms of tobacco. Well, you've already elucidated that, talking about the incidence of lung cancer, the occurrence of lung cancer associated with rolling of tobacco. I would now turn back to Dr. Madrid. Please, can you tell us right, some if, symptoms if, of lung cancer? If I may quickly address that question, if yes, you please, don't mind. Please go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, tobacco use comes in different forms. Uh, you know, we know in Nigeria that people will chew tobacco. Um, in India, there's a lot of uh, people who do similar things like that. That is actually not what we're talking about when we're talking about tobacco and lung cancer. That has its own problem. It causes a different type of cancer, but actually the burning and inhaling the smoke from burning tobacco that is associated with the risk of developing lung cancer. So you have to burn the tobacco, inhale the that then damages the lung cells that leads to cancer eventually. Thank you so much, bro. Dr. Madwadi, please, what are the symptoms of lung cancer? How can people know? How can I know if I have lung cancer? What will I see? Thank you, Dr. Obiaton. So, um, and then I, I want to also acknowledge Dr. Professor Taufik's um, explanations as regarding the tobacco uh, thing, because everything, most times it has to be inhaled because the lung is an, is an irritated organ. Everything that happens there, most the changes has to do with inhalation. And that's um, because there's been some, um, so that uh, people who live in industrialized areas are in, have increased risk of having uh, lung cancer as against those who live in, in a less remote or less uh, rural rural settings. And is this um, suggestion is uh, there's this this is tending to to this this help making people think that exposure to uh, fumes from exhaust of vehicles and all that could also be contributory. Um, factors towards the development of um, lung cancer. I haven't said that, how do they present? Unfortunately, most times you will not know that the patient has lung cancer or somebody will not know that he has lung cancer until the disease has become very advanced. In the meantime, usually they will present with cough, most times cough, which is not responding to antibiotics, not responding to any form of treatments, persisting for several weeks to several months, sometimes with um, hemoptysis that is coughing out of blood. Patient may be, there may be blood related um, cough in the patient. There may be things like change in voice may come in. The patient may experience weight loss. Then the patient may have things like back pain. By the time they start having back pain, then it, it, it's possible that the cancer has started traveling out of um, the lung where it's originating, originating from. So um, it's often difficult to, because most of the symptoms that will point towards lung cancer are similar symptoms that you find in someone that has pneumonia, for example, someone that has heart uh, um, conditions, for example. So it becomes important that when somebody has these symptoms, he should seek medical attention, he should come to the hospital, go to see a doctor, the doctor will have to evaluate, ask questions, give treatment, have follow-ups, and ask for a couple of investigations, and then be able to arrive at diagnosis, um, hopefully, in time. So, um, to say that what might be the one of the earlier symptoms, because I know people are worried about cancers. Are there symptoms that you should watch out for? One or two early symptoms. If you notice this, it might be a lung cancer. Um, One of the most important symptoms to watch out for is the cough. Mm. So someone who is having protracted cough, 
most times it has you have several forms of ter of treatment and the cough is not um, abating mm -hmm. such should raise um, should, should raise suspicion and in any case you should see a doctor and then a simple chest 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 x-ray might help to pick something and then there are or there are uh, because these symptoms might not necessarily point to aid there are screening um, suggested screening um, with CTs that is being suggested currently, though it's still um, undergoing evolution. But symptomatically, it's difficult to hold on to a symptom and say this is lung cancer. And it will not be right for us to tell um, any patient that once you feel this cough, then you have lung cancer. That will be raising so much of anxiety because majority of the cough people actually suffer from are not lung cancer in, in, in um, reality, but these are one of the, these are the, uh, some of the sim symptoms that the patient will present with. But if the patient is having a protracted cough and is having weight loss, and then there is blood in the cough, it calls for serious investigation. Even though there are other conditions that will give similar presentations or similar symptoms, it is important that cancer be excluded at that time. Thank you so much. You mentioned diagnostics, and we do know that in Nigeria, people present late with a lot of cancer. There is a, there's an issue with late presentation. From your experience, what do you think, what are the causes or factors that influence late presentation of cancer cases? The, 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 Issues of late presentation for lung cancer is not different from what is happening um, for most other cancers, essentially, especially in here in, um, in Nigeria. The most, one of them is um, the religious and cultural beliefs. People um, will rather go to other places before the hospital. But there, this is not just, I, I, for me, it's not only a patient factor because um, the hospital itself they are, they are often ill-equipped to attend to patients' needs. The, the facilities are often not there, and where they are available, it takes a whole long process, a whole long time to achieve diagnosis, and it's often stressful. So a lot of them tend to get to the church first, get to the mosque first, or go to the prayer house and then use, um, it's not my portion, and all that. You don't want to get, then there's that denial. So at the end of the day, it takes a longer time before the patient is diagnosed. And even when they present to the hospital, especially in our settings, they, they, you cannot under, undermine the place of underdiagnosis or misdiagnosis as a result of poor um, facilities, presence of poor, uh, no, no, no sufficient facilities to make such diagnosis. And then because of the number of um, patients that come with these conditions, the, the health workers themselves are ill prepared to um, raise their, their suspicion of these conditions when the patients present. So all these things contribute to, to, to delay in diagnosis. And don't forget the place of poverty. We cannot undermine its role also because if um, very few people can actually afford the basic investigations, like a simple test radiograph, for instance, very, very few people will be able to afford it. And then it's not available in most, um, in, a, in several um, um, community practices in the country. So when you put all these things together, you find out that um, diagnosis of lung cancer will always be um, delayed and contributes to what I Yeah. So the aspect of this is, um, in addition to the challenges that we face in the environment that uh, we live in Nigeria, uh, when you look at even the developed societies where a lot of uh, opportunities exist for diagnosis, majority of patients are still diagnosed at relatively late stage of the disease. So, uh, the primary reason for that being that the symptoms of lung cancer, as Dr. Madhu already uh, 
rightly listed for us can also be ascribed to so many other things that are much more common. Mm -hmm. And the, the way we practice medicine is that common things occur commonly. So you don't want to start thinking of the rarer things before you think of the common things. So somebody coughing and feeling short of breath, it's probably the doctor will think first of you know, pneumonia than start thinking of lung cancer. But the problem is when it becomes persistent and doesn't go away, and you've treated what you presume to be pneumonia and it's not getting better. That's when you have to now start thinking of other things, of what can this be? Not a matter of what is this? You know, people start with what is this because that is all they think about. And if what you think it is is not responding to your treatment, then you have to start thinking broadly of what can be like this? And that is when you start thinking. On chest x-ray diagnosis, we're only going to catch the late stage lung cancers. And by late stage, we mean um, situations where the cancer is like stage three or four, where we cannot guarantee cure. Um, but 60, 65% of our patients in the US are still diagnosed at the advanced stage of uh, lung cancer uh, because of this. You know, you conflate the symptoms, the, the early symptoms will not necessarily tell you it's lung cancer and then you have to start thinking of other things before you get to it. Secondly, in Nigeria, I think ignorance complicates our lack of infrastructure, uh, you know, blaming things on things that don't have anything to do with the problem and seeking solutions where none exists, uh, I think also we need to delay presentation and diagnosis. And um, the, the other aspect of this uh, is that when somebody knows that they've smoked, and we define smoking as somebody who has smoked at least 100 cigarettes of, uh, sticks of cigarettes in their life, that is what we define a smoker is. So it's not somebody in college who just stole a uh, a stick of cigarette and run away with it. That is not a smoker. But somebody who consistently on a regular basis has smoked at least 100 sticks of cigarette, we consider that to be smoking. Now, heavy smoking is when we smoked what we call 10 packs per year, meaning you smoked at least a pack of cigarettes every day, you know, for about 10 years. That would be heavy smoking. Somebody who falls into that category, if they have this type of symptoms, they have to start thinking that this is not, you can have pneumonia, but if your pneumonia is not responding to simple treatment, you have to now start thinking beyond that. And I know that in, on the panel, uh, we have a question from Dr. Um, I'm sorry, I, I lost that name now, but I'll, I'll pronounce the name correctly afterwards. Okay, uh, it's one of the surgeons in Nigeria. Okay. Uh, saying that they have access to perhaps maybe minimally invasive way of obtaining tissue sample. You know, bronchoscopy, when I used to practice in Nigeria, and even when I trained in Nigeria, you know, we always say, oh, we don't have cancer in Nigeria because we don't see it. Yeah, you don't see it because you don't look for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we all assume like it's not there because you don't have the facilities uh, to make the diagnosis. Therefore, we say it does not exist. Uh, so having the expertise locally and the technology to help do non-invasive tests that will help you know patient to understand what is going on uh, i think would help to a great deal in establishing the diagnosis early uh, and then thank you so much dr Taufi. That was very enlightening. Dr. Madwani, thank you so much. I think I will take some of the questions because some of our attendees have also raised some questions and we will take some of the questions. Um, now, going to lung cancer, we have already... Is lung cancer hereditary? One of our attendees is asking, that's Okwe uh, Adua. Is it ever cured or curable? For how long can it be managed and how? So I'll throw this open to both of our panelists. Is it hereditary? I know that we had asked this question before. Is it curable? Yeah. And how can it be managed? 
I can help with that, um, given that I've spent my entire career looking at this problem. Um, in general, we can say that lung cancer is not hereditary disease. Uh, people don't pass it on to their children. You don't inherit it from your parents, uh, which is what we mean by hereditary. Uh, most cancers are genetic problems, meaning there is a problem with the genetic content of the, of the cell that leads to cancer. But it's not because you inherited it from somebody else. Uh, it's not from witchcraft, because we know lung cancer exists where people don't believe in witchcraft. People don't suffer from, okay? Um, the, can it be cured? Yes. It can be cured if we catch it early. About 20% of patients will present, I'm talking of the US population now, um, possibly also in Europe, about 20% of the patients there will present in stage one or two lung cancer, which is what we're talking about. Maybe a small nodule in the lung that the surgeon can easily take out as uh, uh, someone like Dr. Conter, or if it's gone into the lymph node, it's limited to a small amount of lymph node that the surgeons can still take out. So if you find it at that stage, when it is still relatively contained and you can take it out by surgery, it's potentially curable. About 50-60% of those patients can be cured if they go through with surgery and possibly chemotherapy afterward. If it has moved extensively into the lymph nodes, especially in the center of the chest, you still can cure it but that requires much more aggressive intervention that would include possibly surgery, definitely chemotherapy, and definitely radiation treatment. So you have to use three different modalities. Curing it is probably around 40% of patients. So even in the best places, best centers in the world where you have access to everything and you can throw it all at the cancer, if you are dealing with stage three disease, currently we probably can cure it in about 40% of patients. If it has moved and traveled beyond that local regional area outside of the lymph node, maybe to the other side of the lung or to other parts of the body, at the current moment, that is not curable. Uh, if one is going to pray that they're going to cure it, it's absolutely false. It's a lie. Uh, you know, we live in societies where people are so pray, people believe in God and do everything. So God is not partial. Okay. So we it as metastasized at the current time, we do not have any means of curing it. Now that does not mean we cannot treat it. I currently have some patients with stage four lung cancer who have been alive. You know, I have one maybe out now with stage four, 14, 15 years and going, but that is not the typical outcome that you see for majority of the patients. If it's stage four and that is what you're dealing with, on average, those patients would only survive about two to three years maximum based on what we currently have. The good news is, as we better understand the biology of the disease, and we're now recognizing these other types of lung cancer that are not associated with smoking, the outcomes with those tends to be better and we have better treatment for those where we may not even have to use chemotherapy, even when it is stage four. And if that is what we're dealing with, you know, those patients tend to do a lot better. And now with the latest use of immunotherapy approaches, we're actually beginning patients with stage four lung cancer live past that three, two, three year time point that I quoted. We now see patients living out to five, six years. We don't want to call it cure because Making that type of claim is too aggressive. You really need solid data to back it up. Uh, but we have what we now call long-term survivors. We don't, we're not calling them cured yet because we don't know what's still going to happen, whether the cancer will come back. But in general, how we define when it comes to treatment is that you've gone through treatment, you don't have evidence of the cancer coming back for five years then you say that patient is cured of their cancer. We know that for majority of patients with metastatic cancer, regardless of the site, whether it's lung cancer, breast cancer, or any other type of cancer, we cannot make that claim at the current time. That if the cancer has spread and it is metastatic, we can make them for a cure. Potentially, we might get there with immunotherapy
the disappointing part of immunotherapy it does not affect every patient. So it's typically about 20 to 30 percent of patients where we see this long-term uh, durable benefit that we are hoping will hold on for a very very long time and be able to transfer that or transform that to cure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taupi. So this question is for both of our panelists still, and this is talking more, let's go back a little for diagnosis. One of the attendees, um, Ayobanji Fagbo, are there specific markers, tumor markers for, that are specific for lung cancer? And this also talks about diagnosis. I know that Dr. Madwali talked about chest X-ray and CT scan. Um, so how can, how is lung cancer diagnosed generally? Are there tumor markers that are specific for this uh, condition? Yeah, so, so okay. oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Madwadi. No, no, no. Oh, okay, so I, I think I'll just address the, um, I'll, I'll let Professor Taufik talk to us about possibilities of any tumor markers and all of that. But essentially, the, the, it's important to know that the reason, um, one of the reasons why one of the take homes from this presentation will be being able to diagnose this condition before at, at stage one or two, before it gets to stage three and four, where treatment modalities, treatment options have, has, has narrowed down and then success rate has become uh, significantly um, lowered. So it's important that, so that's why um, if, if we listen to Prof. Uh, uh, discussion a few minutes ago, he was talking about um, the smokers taking history from the patient, patient who is coughing and then already has history as a heavy smoker. The management approach will be different because you will need to investigate further. So the, the current trend is usually chest, chest, chest history is one of the easiest thing to get done and you will see it's possible to find something Commonly, what we describe as a solitary pulmonary nodule, which may not be so clear there. So the, the current trend, the world is looking at um, doing what is called the low dose um, CT screening. It's not yet totally um, acceptable in globally, but I know places like US and a couple other countries are using it. In Nigeria, we don't have that policy in place yet, but I think it's doing <laughs> Because um, the essence of that is to, because the, the, the fear is that CT alone, CT in itself is, is, is a high dose, um, is a, is a, it has carries radiation risk. And then um, you need to image with lower doses to reduce the risk of um, cancer, in, radiation induced cancers in the future and all those um, thoughts around it. But the, with the low dose CTs, we found that you can easily pick a nodule in those patients. And then with the help of the surgeons, we'll be able to do a biopsy, minimally invasive biopsy, CT guided biopsies, and then you can get a tissue diagnosis at that stage, and then the patient can get properly treated. As to so if you have to do uh, tumor markers, I'm not aware of any tumor marker that will be specific enough, that is specific for, for lung cancer. So I think the basic way of diagnosing this disease is through imaging. And then with the image guided um, interventions, you can get tissue diagnosis and then institute treatment early enough. So I'll, I'll um, turn over to Dr. Taufik so that he can tell us more about um, this. Yeah, so those are the uh, considerations when it comes to diagnosing lung cancer. Uh, we don't have a reliable blood test that you can just walk into the lab, draw a lab, and then they tell you, oh, there's uh, evidence of lung cancer in your blood. Having said that, uh, the test that people use, we no longer use it. Um, the old time oncologists still rely on it. Uh, a small blood test called CEA. We use it more. In colon cancer patient, for instance, because there it is much more reliable. For lung cancer, it's less reliable because even smokers who don't have lung cancer can have elevated, elevated uh, level of CEA in their blood. So we don't rely on that to diagnose patients. 
More recently, though, we are beginning to understand, along with the um, CT screening strategies, which for a resource limited uh, situation that we face in Nigeria may not be viable at this point. And uh, you know, if you look at what the problems are, you have to think about what is really most impactful for the society, not just what is available. You know, where we have incidence of breast cancer that is maybe 10 times the incidence of lung cancer, for instance, you probably want to put more resources diagnosing breast cancer than uh, putting that resource into looking for lung cancer. But letting people be aware of what the symptoms are and when to seek additional answers if the simple explanation for their symptoms will not uh, suffice, I think will help minimize the allocation of in the country, but which are also very important. Um, because the long screening trials rely on the use of low-dose CT scan uh, on a fairly regular basis, annual scan for three years was what was shown to be impactful. That is not sustainable for a lot of the low to middle income countries. Even in the richer countries, it is also challenging. In fact, in the US, uh, when the screening trial was initially reported, and this was a study that was done in the US, it was not approved by the, um, the task force that reviews data and makes recommendation for public health use. Uh, they endorsed it, but it was a weak endorsement uh, because they thought that when you look at the impact and some of the other consequences of going through uh, lung screening, the benefit was not sufficient to justify it. Now, subsequent to that, we've now had two more trials show that truly this strategy works and helps to save lives. So now that task force has gone back to look at the data and they've revised their recommendation now to a more, to a stronger endorsement that this is something that saves lives and should be considered uh, for patients. Um, there is now effort to further refine the impact of screening trial by looking at markers within the sputum, not in blood, uh, but in sputum to say, can you find something very early on in patient sputum that will let you, that will let you know that there's something that's going on that would then aid you to select patients who will benefit from the CT screening instead of just screening every patient. The reason why you don't want to screen every patient in terms of cost benefit and risk benefit analysis is even when you look within smokers, it's not every smoker that develops lung cancer. You know, there is what we call the 80 20 rule 80% of smokers will not develop lung cancer, but 80% of lung cancer patients will be smokers. So that tells you that. The fact that somebody smoked doesn't mean that everything that's wrong with them is lung cancer. But when you look at patients who eventually develop lung cancer, majority of them would have had exposure to tobacco. So after that time, I would not be surprised that in the next five to ten years, we're most likely going to have either a blood-based test or a sputum-based test that can help pre-screen patients that will identify the higher risk patient that you can then monitor more closely. Uh, using CT scan, for instance. Um, the, for patients who are non-smokers, if they have the known genetic alterations uh, specific for that cancer, we actually can detect that in blood. And we use that to follow patients when they're on treatment uh, currently but we don't use that as a way to first make the diagnosis. So it's only for those patients where we already made the diagnosis. We know the specific genomic uh, characteristics of their cancer and then we can look for that in blood as a way to monitor the patient while on treatment. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taufik. So just writing on some of the questions, some of the issues you've raised, how safe are non-smokers in smokers' environment? So people are asking, Sally Foods in particular, people that if you are living with a smoker but you are not smoking, how safe are you? And how long would a non-smoker have 
cancer if he or she is staying with um, if he or she is exposed to smoking how long would it take for a non smoker to develop lung cancer so sorry go ahead dr madwari go first i i think you can okay so well the the concept is um Okay, I think I should speak then the topic we, we add to that, but um, smoking generally, you, you don't have to be the one handling this, the stick to be smoking. So that's called secondhand smoke. So as long as you're staying around someone who is smoking, you are equally smoking. And the, the, the secondhand smoke, like Dr. Tafik mentioned earlier, 80% of smokers don't have lung cancer, but the chances of a secondhand smoker having lung cancer is higher because the, the toxins that come out from the cigarette are more likely to cause more damages to the lungs of the non-smoker than the person whose lungs are already adapted to uh, relatively more adapted to the smoking itself. So someone who um, is not a smoker should find ways of not being close to someone who is a smoker or have policies, have, um, uh, there should be some, some policies, some gentlemanly agreements that should come in place. For instance, if you have to go to a hotel, you have to board a vehicle, you should be able to ask for a right to be uh, smoke free. You should be able, you should be able to um, try your best to stay away from smoke because secondhand smoke is as dangerous as, um, as um, smoking directly itself. That's what. That's my thoughts on, on this. Um, so I'll, I'll let the public speak. Thank you. Yeah, that is. Please go ahead, Dr. Taufik. Uh, you have first and smoking the first person in the state. Uh, they are not smoking for those who are in that environment, even though they, they don't have the stick to their lips they're also inhaling the the carcinogens in the air and actually more recently there was a group out of the uk they conducted a very fascinating study of what is called third hand smoking so second hand smoking is you are in the same room or the same enclosed space with someone who is actively smoking so you are all breathing in that uh, air at the same time Third hand smoking has to do with somebody came into a place, smoked and left. You didn't even see them, but they were in that place, they smoked and left and then you came in and they were able to show that the carcinogens from tobacco use can actually hang around in the air for many hours past when the person that smoked had already left. So that is what they call third hand smoking. And all of this carries risk. The problem why it's difficult to quantify is unlike somebody is actively smoking, you can ask them, how much do you smoke? How regularly do you smoke? And you can quantify it. When someone is only exposed to his second hand, you don't know because they're not always there when they smoke. Uh, but what's most dangerous is to smoke in the presence of children. Uh, because everything that we talked about smoking needs time to have consequence. Um, I alluded to that in my, uh, one of my answers before of what do we de define as significant smoking, which is 10 pack years of smoking, meaning somebody will smoke a pack of cigarettes every day for 10 years. Or if they really like it, they smoke 10 packs of cigarettes every day for one year. The consequence is the same. Uh, so you calculate the number of parts of cigarette that somebody has smoked over time to come to how much they've smoked. So you need that time period. It takes about 10 to 15 years minimum, at least from epidemiologic data, for you to see uptake of tobacco use and then incidence of lung cancer going, going up. So it's about two decade lag between tobacco exposure and the development of cancer. So when children are in a environment where people smoke a lot, even though they are not smoking, they're actually getting all that carcinogen into their lungs. And those are patients that you may see, and then in their 40s, but then they're traveling there in the same car together, they have the uh, windows rolled up. They are smoking.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madhuri and Dr. Taufik. So we have heard a lot about lung cancer. How do we prevent lung cancer? I think this is a lot of questions from a lot of our attendees. I can see um, Maureen has been asking this question. Are there any preventive measures for lung cancer? And also, how do we reduce stigma? Because a lot of cancer patients are stigmatized. People think, oh, someone that has cancer is a bad person. If this person is having this growth, and it also has a lot of an impact on the family and the costs, especially in a developing country like Nigeria. So I think I'm posing this question first to Dr. Madwadi and then to Dr. Taufik. How can we prevent lung cancer and how can we support lung cancer survivors, patients, their family members in this um, challenge? Dr. Madwadi first, please. Oh. Okay, I think it's also oh, Dr. Taufik. We lost them. Okay. Yeah. And also one more question from one of the participants talking about tuberculosis yeah. and lung cancer. Because you also yes. talked about um, the common things occurring commonly. How mm -hmm. do you differentiate tuberculosis and lung cancer and then the other questions? Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I can maybe take care of that. Maybe Dr. Madwadi will come back before I finish that. So tuberculosis is an infection uh, that people get exposed to by staying in close contact with somebody who already has active tuberculosis. Um, it's a form of bacteria that gets into your lungs and then takes up residence there and then continues to damage the lungs. And over time, uh, people will become short of breath, they will cough, they will lose weight. So a lot of symptoms that you see with tuberculosis actually will mirror almost identically uh, the symptoms that you see with lung cancer. The way to differentiate both will be number one, exposure to somebody with tuberculosis for that patient. Secondly, somebody like Dr. Madwadi can look at the uh, Imagine the x-ray could be more informative, for instance, with tuberculosis, the typical appearance, CT scan can help, but that is where you can also use the sputum to culture to establish the diagnosis of tuberculosis. And the treatment is different, you know, for tuberculosis, you use antimicrobial uh, antibiotics, uh, for lung cancer is completely different. We generally do not use surgery to treat tuberculosis. There are instances where people with remote history of tuberculosis and the lung damage that development of lung cancer. Those are very, very rare. I don't want people to go on from here and say, oh, you have tuberculosis, you're going to have lung cancer. That is not correct. Uh, but there's what is called the scar related carcinoma, which is where you have chronic lung damage from whatever reason, tuberculosis, other type of a granulomatous infection that can then predispose the development of cancer in the lung down the road. Now, going back to the uh, first question of stigma and lung cancer, and cancer in general, uh, you know, I always tell some of my colleagues that the number one cause of death in Nigeria, and not just in Nigeria, in a lot of, in a lot of societies, is actually ignorance. Uh, and ignorance not because the information is not there, at times ignorance because we refuse to accept the information that is there in front of us. Uh, and this can have very, very serious consequences for patients, their family, their loved ones, uh, where simple steps that could help take care of problems we ignore for a long period of time, and then it becomes a bigger problem in our faces. Stigma for lung cancer is not just something that is limited to Nigeria. Even here in the US, we face the same problem where a lot of people will say, well, you develop lung cancer because you smoked. And you know, this is a society where people pride individualism to the nth degree. Say, well, you had the right to smoke, you smoke, that's your business, go deal with it. Uh, so there could be that um, attitude by the general society to patients with lung cancer to say, I didn't ask you to smoke, you smoke, so that's your problem, go deal with it. But with the recognition now that people who never smoke and also develop lung cancer. And the first of population of cancer, I think we are beginning to move away to overcome that stigmatization for, 
for patients, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, in a society like Nigeria, I think it will be, you know, organizations such as this uh, to spread the knowledge, let people know that this is not something that is unique. The fact that somebody developed any type of cancer, breast cancer, for him, which is the most common, is not because they're evil. It's not because the devil visited them or something. We always say bad things happen to good people too. So we have to educate our people, educate society to know that just because something bad happens does not make that person bad. Um, it's things that can happen in a random fashion to people. It's something that could happen because of choices we've made. But regardless of how you got there, uh, what you really want to do is put that person first. A society is measured by how they care for the weakest amongst them. Be somebody who is sick cannot take care of themselves. Need help at that point. So uh, stigmatizing them and being flippant and dismissive about what they face, I think, is not the right way to go about helping such patients. Dr. Madia, welcome back. Sorry. You are muted. Please unmute your Thank mic. You. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, I had issues with my my computer. I had to move on to my phone. Yeah. So, so what I, about stigmatization? Sure. You know, I, I listened to that talk by Dr. Taufik already. I don't think there's so much to add. And we have to understand that um, for 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 us in the in Nigerian setting, most times stigmatization is not because someone is being individualized and saying, go deal with your challenge. It's more of um, with the, the religious and the cultural background. Maybe this is a demonic attack. Maybe this is contagious. Maybe it's because of his sins and all that. So we need to look beyond all of that as a people and be able to care for one another in a more um, all-inclusive way. I think that way we'll be able to deal with stigmatization. Like you said, ignorance is the main culprit. The more people know about the disease process, the less, um, the more tolerant they become of one another. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if I've seen, heard the answer to how to prevent lung cancer. So I have someone asking, um, do you need to take two warm glass of lemon water first in the morning as prevention to lung cancer? Please, is this scientific and how true is this? And another question, are there foods one can avoid to reduce the risk of lung cancer? Well, if I may add, um, speak on that. Firstly, for the person asking if he has to take warm water to prevent warm lung cancer, water. I'm not sure of any scientific lemon water, any scientific evidence to that. I don't know of any scientific evidence to that. There are a lot of things that people take these days in the name of uh, preventing cancer, but I, I have no scientific um, proof to that. Maybe Professor Taufik will have something to say about that. Maybe there's been some studies in that wise. I doubt. I really, I really doubt. Then um, in terms of food, there is really not um, I cannot think of any food that you need to avoid. But again, weight gain, obesity is implicated in several forms of cancer because of its role in genetic manipulations. So it's also something that we need to look into. Um, weight, weight control will also have some effect in controlling um, the risk as well as disease, as well as progression of uh, lung cancer, just like with the same, with, in the same pathophysiological process that has most other cancers. So in that wise, maybe eating healthy will come in when you have to eat a balanced, eat, um, eat right to avoid excessive weight gain. That's the only area where food may come in for lung cancer. Otherwise, I do not see any other risk of particular food that is um, a risk factor in itself. Yeah, so Talking of science and lemon and warm water first thing in the morning, uh, uh, I don't know if the people doing the research haven't 
yes, but in a more serious note, um, what can we do to prevent lung cancer? I think the one thing that we know is proven is avoid smoking. At least we all can agree on that. Uh, whether direct smoking or if somebody smokes in your environment, if you can't stop them, then move away from there. Uh, that we can do. Uh, a lot of things that people read on the internet, and it's not limited to Nigeria. It, we deal with that everywhere. You know, people put all sorts of things on the internet about their friend that was cured of cancer. And when I have patients coming with that, I said, why don't you call that patient or go and talk to them directly? When you see them in person, then come back and talk to me. People can put all sorts of things on the internet because it's free for all. There's no policeman there telling you you cannot post anything. So all sorts of claims are made. And people, you know, they profit from other people's misfortune, uh, selling them fake cures, uh, whether it's religious-based or whatnot. Unfortunately, it's happening not just in Nigeria, but especially in Nigeria, unfortunately for us, that is another layer of uh, stupidity that we have to overcome as a society. Um, with regards to diet, I think I put something on the, in the chart uh, that for lung cancer specifically, there is no special diet. There is no special diet for lung cancer. For cancer in general, um, Eating healthy, being active, drinking plenty of water, avoiding red meat. You know, those are all common sensical things that have been shown to contribute to good health. And that includes Long brain, heart, cancer, and everything else. Uh, so if you do it, like they say, a rising tide lifts all boats. If you do all these things, it's not just going to help you reduce the risk of cancer. It will also help, you know, keep your brain functioning for much longer, uh, keep you away from any sort of heart problems. Um, and that is all we can say. If people really want to be specific, the only thing that's is reduce calorie intake. So when people do intermittent fasting. So at least maybe that is where you can use religion to impact health outcome rather than people going for, you know, all sort of religious concoction. If they want to fast, that would be good for them. The unfortunate thing is a lot of people are already fasting, not out of choice, uh, but out of necessity. So I don't know whether that is something that we can adopt uh, at the societal level. The other thing is, you know, we also adopt certain practices that are harmful. Uh, in Nigeria these days, the fancy thing is to go out and eat, you know, fast food, uh, which is actually the reverse of what healthy eating is like. You know, people do that here because they cannot afford healthy food. Whereas in Nigeria, the more healthy foods are probably cheaper than the fast food that people are wasting money buying on a daily basis. So eating fresh rather than eating all these pre-cooked, uh, you know, high fat content meals will actually go a long way in making people healthy rather than our social connotation of, you know, uh, I'm living well and um, I'm, you know, I can afford all this. Uh, well, before I go on rambling, as I don't want to start preaching to people, but it's just my pet peeves at times. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. I just want to give a short, a brief summary of what I have learned. I know a lot of people have learned today. We now know why lung cancer is important. We have also heard that cigarette smoking is the most common predisposing factor for lung cancer. And secondhand smoking, and I think I've learned something new today, thirdhand smoking, they are um, also predisposing factors. So even if a person has smoked where you were and the person has left, you are still at a risk of having um, lung cancer. In addition, there is no study saying that firewood is not, may or may not be associated with lung cancer. This is something that is being looked at. And we've also learned about cigarette smoking, what is um, a smoker and heavy smoking, and how the incidence of lung cancer is rising and falling with cigarette use, meaning that it's a key factor. 
We also learned about TB and lung cancer, that these symptoms may mirror lung cancer, but the diagnosis and the treatment options are different. And there are several factors influencing um, lung cancer um, diagnosis and treatment issues with diagnostics at the hospital, low index of suspicion, and even the fact that common things occur commonly, so we might be looking at the symptoms um, at, 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 at lung cancer, but think it's another disease because a lot of other diseases mirror lung cancer. And on the part of the patients, issues around cultural beliefs, denials, and um, also poverty may also be an issue. Um, there is no reliable blood test for lung cancer currently, and the checks X-ray only catches the disease in late stages. In some countries, low-dose CT screening is in use, which might not be viable in Nigeria as other cancers cause even more deaths than lung cancer. And even in those countries, screening will be streamlined in the future. Uh, there is a possibility of pre-screening. We've also learned about the treatment for lung cancer. I like what Dr. Tafik said, as we understand the biology of the disease, we start having better treatment options and immunotherapy. One of the things on the horizon that might increase survival from lung cancer. And how can we prevent lung cancer? The commonest cause of death is ignorance, especially when we deny what exists. And stigmatization remains an issue, not just in Nigeria, but globally. We should um, recognize that non-smokers may also have lung cancer. And as an NGO, we need to spread knowledge. We need to educate the society on, what, on lung cancer, how it occurs, and care for our weakest. We should care for one another. How can we prevent lung cancer? Avoid smoking move away from smokers. Also ensure that you have a healthy diet, a vegetable rich food, reduce the intake of red meat and even high fat, uh, high fat content meals. Uh, we should avoid fast food, so eat healthy. Exercise is also important and fasting is also one of the things we could uh, um, um, adopt so that we could also improve our, our, our lifestyle. I think um, we have come to the end of the webinar. I would really like to appreciate our panelists. It has been a very wonderful and um, uh, interactive session. I'm sure all our attendees have learned a lot and we hope to still call on you uh, in the future to still spread the word. Thank you so much, Dr. Taufik Owenikoku and Dr. Kesta Madwadi for gracing us with your presence. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. And to all the attendees for taking the time. I hope this has been very useful and helpful. Thank you. Thank Any you. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for, thank you for everyone who has uh, taken out time to be part of this. Thank you, Professor Taufik. It was a pleasure listening to you. Nice meeting you too.